Welcome to Bible Tract Echoes. This program is the radio ministry of Bible Tracts Incorporated. Our mission is to take the Word of God to all the world. Our Bible teacher is the director of Bible Tracts, Pastor Mark Smith. Since 1938, Bible Tracts Incorporated has been publishing clear gospel tracts and supplying them to churches, missionaries, and individuals all over the world, and all at no charge. Information on how you can receive a free sample pack of our tracts will be given at the end of this broadcast. Now for our Bible study, here is our teacher, Pastor Mark Smith. Hello, my friend. Welcome to the broadcast. This is our Tract and Truth Tuesday edition here on Bible Tract Echoes. Did you notice those two words, Tract and Truth? On our Tuesday broadcast, we focus more pointedly on the truth of the gospel, the simple truth. How can a sinner be made right with God? How can a sinner be declared uh, not guilty before God, be declared righteous in God's sight, and know for sure that they are on their way to heaven. We're talking about the gospel truth here. On our Tuesday broadcast, we try to help each other make more clear the simple truth of the gospel and help each other explain it. That brings us also to the word tract, T-R-A-C-T. We're talking about a gospel tract. A gospel tract is a short written presentation telling somebody how to know Jesus Christ as their savior from sin. Again, on our Tuesday broadcast, we hopefully will help one another be more effective in communicating the gospel to the lost folk that are around us. To help us toward that goal today, if you can, take your Bible and turn with me to the gospel of Luke chapter 18. Luke 18, I'm going to start reading at verse 9 in a moment, the familiar story of the two men who went up to the temple to pray, a story, a parable that Jesus told. But to lead into that, let me start this way. Studies show that sugar pills or placebos can actually alleviate symptoms if a sick person believes that these sugar pills are real medicine. Other research showed that many people found these pills helpful even after they were told they were placebos. Now, all this illustrates that a belief, a mind belief, may bring temporary effectiveness in helping a person when they are sick even though it's founded on inaccurate information. But think of the startling implications this can have in the religious realm, in the faith realm. Just as sugar pills can bring temporary relief, so too wrong beliefs about God can result in false feelings of peace and false feelings of happiness. When this occurs in a person's life, that individual may feel no need to trust Christ as his Savior from sin. The question today is, how can you and I witness to somebody who thinks they are all ready and set for heaven because uh, they have some belief system, but their belief system is not founded in the biblical truth of how to be saved from their sin. But they believe they're okay. They're confident they are fine and they're going to be in heaven. How do we witness to somebody like that? That's where we're headed today. Why don't you get some pen and paper ready? Uh, That way you can jot down some notes. But also at the end of my broadcast, when my announcer gives our contact information, you can jot down one of the means to communicate with us, giving us your name and your mailing address. And here's why I want you to do that. I want to send you a free sample packet of our gospel tracks. I'm going to send you 42 or so gospel tracts. Many of these you're going to find very, very helpful in giving the gospel to people. One of the gospel tracts in that sample packet is this one, Comfort in Time of Loss. Comfort in Time of Loss. This gospel tract was designed to be given out when people have lost a dear friend or dear loved one. People are coming to minister to them. You know Christ is Savior, but sometimes those trying to help you and grieve with you do not. Here, you can give them the gospel. It's during a time of great loss and grief that some people's minds are far more turned to eternity and have questions about how can I be prepared when my day of death comes. Here's a great, great tool that lovingly communicates the gospel, comfort in time of loss. Just one of the gospel tracks that's in that sample packet. Be ready when my announcer gives that contact information. 
Come with me here, Luke chapter 18, beginning at verse 9. The Bible says this, And he, that's Jesus, spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Jesus said, Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even as this publican. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes to all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes to heaven, but smote his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus goes on and says, I tell you, this man, the second man, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humble himself shall be exalted. Stop right there. How in you can you and I witness to a very religious person, a person who's convinced that they are religious enough, righteous enough, they've got the right answers to get into heaven? Well, there's some things that we're going to have to do. Number one, in dealing with this person, we're going to, have to deal with the whole issue of the sinfulness of people. We're going to help have to help them see biblical truth and how dead in sin are we. And I need to just state that I want to go on to some other things. But dear friend, sometime you need to uh, just look at your Bible, read the Bible for what it says about how dead in sin are, is a person without Jesus Christ. They are sinful from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. Uh, their mind and heart have been perverted due to the sin and the curse of sin upon the human race. Oh, dear friend, we are totally dead in sin. But secondly, we've also got to help this religious person help them in dealing with the whole basis of the salvation message. What is a salvation message? And it comes down to that. The salvation is in Christ alone. It's not Christ plus something else, something else that you can do. It's not Christ plus uh, your baptism. It's Christ alone. When I'm talking to a person who's very religious and feels that they are ready for heaven, I will often remind them about the story in Luke 18. Most of the time, they are somewhat familiar with the story. And if I can't, I reread them the story. Here in this story, I say, here are two men. And uh, I say to the person, these two men are really very easy to categorize. I say one of them is very religious and one of them is a publican. And I explain what that means a little bit to them. Here's a person who is not very religious. He's not practiced religion in their life. And they've lived a, a very uh, immoral life. They're just a, a down-to-earth person living following their own dictates in their life. And after I explain or read the story, explain this, uh, who these two men are, I then turn to this religious person to whom I'm speaking and I ask them questions. Questions like this, which of these two men was the religious one? Now that's not a hard question, is it? Which of these two men was a religious one? There's another question. How do you know he was religious? Well, the man in his prayer there laid out how he was religious. He fasted and so on. And then I ask this question, why isn't the other man very religious? Well, obviously, life actions told us he wasn't very religious. But then I say, which man did God say was justified in God's sight? Which man was justified? Now, we're getting to the heart of the matter here. At this point, I must run the risk of offending the person to whom I'm speaking, but it cannot be helped. I must run the risk of offending them. I asked them this question, which of these two men is most like you? Which of these two men is most like you? Now, often the person really does not want to answer that question. They'll try to do a glancing blow onto some other topic, and I don't let them do that. If possible, again, I run the risk. I try to back them into a corner and make them choose. Are you man number one or are you man number two? Are you person number one or person number two? I've got to get this person to see who they are. Religious, yes. But they, that religious person in the story was not declared to be right in God's sight. The other guy was. The first person, religious person, did all kinds of things, but trying to make themselves look good on their own merit. 
the other person came and begged for mercy, not on what they had done or not done, just simply God be merciful to me. And on that basis, trusting God alone, the second person was declared to be right. And helping us with that, can I share with you the story of John Wesley? Now, the life of John Wesley, uh, who started the Methodist Church, illustrates, frankly, very clearly, the importance of trusting in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Now, John Wesley went to Oxford Seminary for five years. He then became a minister in the Church of England, where he served for about 10 years. And towards the end of that 10-year period, he became a missionary from England to the state in the New World called Georgia. Now, all of his life, he was quite a failure at ministry life. He was quite a failure, even though he was very pious. He would get up at four o'clock in the morning. He prayed for two hours. Then he would read the Bible for an hour. Before that, after that, he went to the jails and the prisons and the hospitals and he ministered to people in all kinds of situations. He would teach people and pray with people. He would help people late into the night. He did this for literally years. In fact, the Methodist Church gets its name Methodist from the methodical life of the piety of John Wesley and the friends who were practicing these these disciplines with him. Well, one day on the way back from America to England, there was a great storm at sea. The little ship that they were sailing on was about to sink. Huge waves were breaking over the ship's deck, and the wind had shredded the sails of the ship. Wesley feared he's going to die that very evening. He was terrified. You see, he had no assurance that if he died, he was going to go to heaven. Despite all of his efforts to be good, death for him was a by his own description, a big, black, fearful question mark. But then on the other side of the ship, there was a group of men who were in the same storm singing hymns. He asked them, how can you sing on the very night when you're going to die? They replied, if the ship goes down, then we're going to go to be with the Lord forever. Wesley left that conversation shaking his head. How can they know this, he wondered. Well, they did get back to England, and in the providence of God, not long after getting back, he went to a, at the Aldersgate Chapel, he heard a man reading a sermon that had been written two centuries earlier by Martin Luther. In the, he was reading Luther's preface to the book of Romans. The sermon described what real faith was. It's trusting only in Jesus Christ for salvation, not our good works. All of a sudden, Wesley suddenly realized that he had been on the wrong road of life. And that night, he wrote these words in his journal, and I quote, About a quarter after nine, while he was describing the change which God worked in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust Christ that night, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away all my sin, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin, death, and hell. End quote. There you have it, friends, saving faith, repenting of your sin, trusting in Jesus alone for salvation. We've got to help people come to grips with that religious faith is not saving faith. Saving faith is trusting in Christ alone, not you and your good works. Luke 18, good passage for soul winners. Amen. Thank you for joining us today for Bible Track Echoes. If you would like to receive a free sample packet of our tracks, You can contact us by calling 309-828-6888. Our mailing address is Bible Tracks, P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. Again, our phone number is 309-828-6888. And our mailing address is P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. You can also contact us through our website. Our web address is BibleTracksInc.org. Remember, the word tracks is spelled T-R-A-C-T-S. That address is BibleTracksInc.org. May the Lord richly bless you as you serve Him.